Well, here's how bank accounts work, and most of you in this room probably have a bank account of some kind or another. The idea is that you deposit money before you try to make a withdrawal. You put in enough deposits so that when it's time to make a withdrawal, you have the financing there, all right? Our government hasn't learned this lesson yet, but that's the idea. You put money in first, and then you can make a withdrawal. Now, that also works with our minds. You've been making deposits into your mind for for a long time, and it goes way, way back. And just to kind of prove that to you for a moment, here, just answer this question. What is, um, what's 6 plus 15? 21. Very good. 6 plus 15 is 21. A few of you are still catching up a little bit. Take out your little paper and pencil. You'll do great here, all right? And uh, what's the capital of Illinois? Thank you. Springfield. Very, very good. All right. Uh, what's 50 minus 11? 39. There. That's my age. So you got that figured out now. <laughs> See, a long time ago in school, you put some, you made some deposits into your mind so that when you'd need them, you'd be able to draw on those deposits. Let me, I, I understand not everyone's married in a room, but just for a moment, let me talk to the married couples for a moment. M- marriage ends up getting bankrupt because we, we fail to make enough positive deposits into our marriage. Uh, the words we use, the activities, the dating, the spending time together. All the things we did before we were married. But once we get married, we stop making those positive deposits. And let me tell you something about relationships. There will always be a withdrawal. There will always be something that comes along that will make a withdrawal on a relationship and on a marriage. And the marriages that avoid bankruptcy are the marriages that are constantly making positive deposits into that marriage. And some of you today, you could, you, could t- you could turn everything around in your marriage just by getting back to doing things the way you did when you were dating, just making those positive deposits, the phone calls, the gifts, those kind of things. All right? Now, I tell you all of that to tell you that your mind is also uh, a place where we deposit God's word. Where, where we spend time in God's word, reading it, studying it, memorizing it, so that we can have those deposits. So that when a crisis comes along in our life and we need to make a withdrawal, those words will come back for us. Uh, again, just as an example, I, I think most of you can do this. Finish this verse for me. For God so loved the world that he, there it is, beautiful, that he gave his son. The only reason you were able to call on that verse is because you had made that deposit a long, long time ago. Not everyone in this room could finish that verse. We're in a series we titled Jesus Loves Me, and it's based on the little children's song, Jesus Loves Me. And today I want to turn our attention to the second phrase in that little song. This I know for the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Skeptics love to point out, by the way, that this little song, uh, the phrase, Jesus loves me, doesn't appear in Scripture. Oh, what? You're saying? Or you would have said if you would have known. That, the, the exact phrase, Jesus loves me, is, is not in the Bible. And that, that's true. However, there's enough There's enough information in there that it's easy to conclude that Jesus loves us. And it comes so close to that phrase. In John 13, verse 34, Jesus says, As I have loved you, you must love one another. In John 15, 9, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. So, you know, it's pretty close. And then in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, Jesus said, that somebody would lay down their life for a friend. Jesus reached the pinnacle of all great loves by laying down his life for us, and in that is the message that we are loved. So, you know, when the critics want to get off on the Jesus, you know, it doesn't say Jesus loves me in the Bible, don't you listen to that. It's there, it's not in that exact phrase, but it's clearly stated. And how do I know that Jesus loves me? There is this huge directional sign inside this song that points to, guess what? God's Word. It points us to the Bible because it's the Bible that tells me so. Everything we do, everything we believe is based not on our feeling, not on the changing society, but on the unchanging Word of God. And to the young people in the room for a moment, 
if you, if you grow up to be the kind of person that says, I stand where the Bible stands, that, that's going to end up taking a lot of courage in our world. The problem is, is that our world is full of biblical illiteracy, and now that, that is starting to find its way into the church. There, the church is, has never been more biblically illiterate than it is today. At a time when we've never had more access to God's word than we do today. If you have a cell phone, you have access to God's word anytime, any place you want it. In fact, you can even set your phone to chime and remind you of Bible readings or, or devotional material that's now out there. The availability of the Bible in your life has never been greater than it is today, and yet the illiteracy of the Bible has never been higher. How do you explain that? I'm not talking about technical devices for just a moment. Let's go back to an old leather bound. There's two different Bibles in our world and two different Bibles probably represented here at the church. Uh, there is what's called the tattered Bible. It's, it's, uh, it's tattered. The bindings are, are giving way. There's pages that have been torn. There's scotch tape in, in uh, some pages holding them together. There's notes written in it, and it's, it's a, a tattered Bible. And, and the tattered Bible usually belongs to someone who's, who's spending a lot of time in it. They're, they're familiar enough with it that if you called out, hey, let's all turn to the book of so-and-so, they could find it real quick. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a book that's been used. And what you need to know about the tattered Bible is, is that it's a really rare Bible. It's not the most popular Bible in our world. There's a second kind of Bible, and it's called the ignored Bible or the dusty Bible. And the dusty Bible, uh, a lot of people have one. It, it's hard to find. Uh, sometimes it's put away or, or unless there's a crisis. Once there's a crisis, we find it really quick. But it's stored away. We don't have time for the ignored Bible or the dusty Bible very often. And what you need to know about the ignored Bible is it is... It is the most popular Bible we have in our world. Which Bible do you carry? There's uh, some stats that are out there that were pretty surprising to me. The frequency of Bible reading in America, and here's how it breaks down. 13% say that it said they read it daily. 22 read it weekly. 7% read it monthly, 30% read it yearly, and only 28% said never. I was shocked by that, by the way. I expected those numbers to be totally different. And, and, but because I'm a little cynical, it, it kind of hit me that, you know, how would you have answered if there suddenly was a phone call and somebody said, we're taking up a survey, and, you know, how often do you read the Bible? Would you have been tempted maybe to fudge a little bit and maybe say you do more than you really do? I think maybe that's why those numbers uh, are surprising. But the question still is valid. Where do you fall on that graph? Where do you fall on that, that pie chart? Well, if we're not spending a lot of time reading our Bible, then, then what are we doing? That's the other side of, this, of these statistics. Average time is spent in the following. 35 minutes on Facebook each day. 40 minutes on YouTube. 100 minutes on Netflix. Uh, thir 300 minutes on our cell phone, 305 minutes watching TV. And yet, I hear all the time, uh, I don't have the time to read the Bible in my life. God knew that the Bible would be ignored. God knew his word would be forgotten. God knew that his scripture would be attacked. The world tells us you can't trust the Bible. God knew that that was going to happen. That's why God spends so much time in his word trying to build up the idea of his, of his word in our life. You know, I, I have the privilege of being the minister at Lincoln Christian Church right now. It is an absolute privilege. I have the privilege of being in the pulpit. And today I have the privilege uh, of ringing the bell one more time for God's word. Some of us in this room who are, who are really involved in our spiritual journey, what the next step is in our spiritual journey, is to get more into God's word. 
we've provided all kinds of great opportunities. We have some of the, we literally have some of the world's best teachers in Sunday school teaching uh, the Bible. And you can pick up any one of those classes and you get great fellowship and you get to know more people, but you get to study God's word deeper. We have small groups here and at any point you can join a small group and get involved more. There's ways that we've made so that you can get more Bible into your life, but we don't force them on you. And you're really at a crossroads today. I, am I going to follow this path of the world that ignores the Bible and doesn't, doesn't trust it? Or am I going to get on the path that God wanted for his word and make it more a priority in my life? And, he, and here's some things that God said about his own word. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy has never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, although human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Paul speaking to a young minister in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, Paul points out all scripture is God-breathed, all of it. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness so that the servant of God, so that that's us, we may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Uh, here's something that's fascinating. Paul is writing to Timothy and he's telling them all, he's telling them all scripture is God breathed, which ends up becoming part of God's ordained word for us. But, but Timothy's a young minister. He's going into ministry, and he's got a young congregation. And Paul, what Paul is telling him here, will not only be a blessing for this young minister to have this view of God's word, but it will ultimately bless his congregation to have a minister who believes that the word is, is God-breathed. This passage was read at my ordination service 35 years ago. And, and when I was challenged to become a, a preacher, and, and the minister uh, who was challenging me used this verse, and he said, you take the word to people, just like Gene Apple said today on the video. You make sure that you're taking the word to other people. And, and not only will it bless me to have a firm stand in God's word, it will ultimately bless my congregation as well to have a minister who does not bend with the times. Later on, the Bible will tell us to preach the word in season and out of season. For a whole bunch of people in this world, the Bible is out of season for them. They don't want to hear it. Some of you, I, I wonder how many of you are going to make it all the way to the end, being right where God wants you to be in regards to his word. Because Paul's also, in, in the very next chapter of Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, Paul tells this young minister this, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. That, that's not a verse about the world, by the way. That's a verse about the church. There will be some in the church who will not put up with sound doctrine after a while, and that means some of you are not going to make it. And ultimately, you'll end up turning on the minister for hate speech. This isn't new. This doesn't surprise God. God's always had an assault on his word. Because the word of God is so important to him, we can expect that Satan was going to attack it. And guess what? All the way back at the beginning, the first couple in human history, they received the first attack on God's word. Way back in the book of Genesis, you got Genesis chapter 1 where God is, is creating uh, the world. Genesis chapter 2, he's, he's completing it with the creation of mankind. And then in chapter 3, he puts them in this garden and he gives them a, a command. You, you can eat of any fruit of the tree you want, but just don't eat of this one tree, this forbidden fruit. And de the devil comes at Eve, questioning God. It's in Genesis chapter, one, uh, chapter 3 verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty, the serpent meaning the devil, was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? Did God really say that? 
This is the first question in the Bible, by the way, and this is the first question in human history. Did God really say that? As if Satan is trying to tell you and I that we have a right to sit in judgment on what God said. You have a right to question what God has said. That's what Satan is implying here to Eve. Did God really say that? And you would think that Eve would be suspicious of anyone who would question God, but she wasn't. Oh, at first she answers really well. She says to the serpent, God said, if we eat of that forbidden fruit, we'll die. And what Satan does next is what has been following us all through mankind. In verse 4, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, enlightened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You will not surely die. God said you'll die if you eat it, and the serpent says you will not die. Now stop for a moment. Who was right? Oh, it's a, it's a great study if, you're, if you ever have a chance to do it. In, in, in chapter 3, God says don't eat of that fruit or, or you'll die, and then the devil comes along and says you won't die. And then in chapter 5 is this genealogy, and I think God put the Bible together just this way. There's this genealogy, and it's a bunch of names, and I know we don't like reading genealogies and a bunch of names, but what happens in there behind every name is, and then he died. Eight times, eight times, Genesis 5 says, and then he died, and then he died, and then he died. Oh, he lived this long, but then he died. And and it it calls you to remember back to chapter 3 when Satan says, you won't die. Who was right in that moment? Yeah. Satan would love to get you to ignore the Bible today. He would love to get you to not trust it. You contrast all that with Jesus, who had perfect trust in God's word. Jesus quotes the scripture 50 times. He refers to the scripture as being the command of God. He refers to scripture as being the word of God. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but but my word will not. It, It remains. Jesus quoted from it, he trusted it, and it's not too late for you and I to jump in and be involved in reading God's word. It's not too late. We got Bible reading plans out at the Welcome Center. We're reading through the New Testament together this year. You can still jump in. You're not so far behind that you can't get involved. But you're at a crossroads today. Let me tell you what's going to happen, too. What's, what's happening right now is that Satan has convinced some of you that you're so far behind, you'll, you'll never know as much as someone else does. Let me tell you something. I'm a minister, and there's always someone who knows more Scripture than I do. Always. When, when you're involved in, in reading the Bible, you'll always find someone who knows more. It was early in ministry. I went out to one of our widows to call on her. Her name was Edith, an elderly lady, just very sweet. Oh, my goodness. A great Bible teacher, by the way. But when I got to her house, the door was open, but the screen door was uh, closed there. And, and I yelled her name out. I knocked on the door. I yelled her name, Edith, Edith, and I never got an answer. And I looked around the back of the yard. She wasn't there. And because she lived in the country, I thought, well, maybe she's just off somewhere, you know, just left the door open. A lot of country people do that. So I did the ministerial thing that you used to do back then. I took out one of my business cards, and on the back I wrote, uh, Dear Edith, and then it, it made me giggle. I, I put down a, a verse of the Bible. I wrote down uh, I, just Revelation 3.20, love Ron. You, you know Revelation 3.20, behold, I stand at the door and knock, <laughs> you know. And if anybody would open the door, I'd come in and we'd eat together. You know, that, that's the verse, and I thought this would be funny, she'll like that. And, you know, so I, I left that card. Next Sunday, I, I looked for Edith, and I finally spotted her from a distance, but uh, she never came up to me. She never said anything. And after church, she was gone, like, right away. And I was like, what in the world is going on with Edith? And I got out to my car, and there was a little note under the uh, windshield wiper of my car. And I'm like, what is this? And I opened it and said, Dear Ron, Genesis 3.10, love Edith. <laughs> I'm like, She's got me. I have no idea what Genesis 3.10 says. So I'm sitting in my car, opened up my Bible, and I read Genesis 3.10. Behold, I heard your voice in the garden, but I hid myself because I was afraid, for I was naked. (laughs) That's just an old joke, by the way. Anyway, 
There's always someone who will know more. There's always someone who will be further along than you. And, and you can let that discourage you or you can say, you know what, no. I feel a strong call to be involved in God's word. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, find a way to open up God's word. Oh, the ultimate blessing is just ahead of you. I started there in Genesis chapter 3 with Adam and Eve, and they're amazing, and then you see their fall, and a little later you'll be reading about Noah, and he's amazing, and then you'll see his fall in life, and same thing's going to happen with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and then you're going to be reading about Moses. Moses is cool, but then here's his fall, and, and God who's writing a history, giving us a history of his people, just keeps showing us how flawed we are. Even as, even as God's people, we're just so flawed and we make so many mistakes. And if you keep at this long enough, sooner or later you're going to turn the page and there's going to be the name Jesus. And there's no flaws. There's no mistakes. There's no sin. And he ends up dying for you and I so that you and I will know that we're loved. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so.